Hey Cherubs, it's Matt. Today we're going to talk about advanced directives and pulsed forms. Now I can already tell that some of you are tuning out. How is this relevant to my training? Well, allow me to explain. Scenario number one. Pretend that you're in your favorite emergency department. 90-year-old demented guy rolls through the door, and ho, oh, he looks bad. His son is the only person who's accompanied him, so you ask him if his father has ever expressed any opinions on CPR and intubation. Ah, his son tells you. I haven't had a conversation of substance with my father in years. See, I pretty much only communicate through social media these days, and he told me that, what was that, that Twitter was not an appropriate medium for serious discourse. Like, I don't even know what that means. I was like, Dad, this is how people get their news these days. And he basically unfollowed me in the real world. Scenario number two. Pretend that you're in your least favorite emergency department. 90-year-old demented guy rolls through the door. Wow, dude is crashing. But it looks like the paramedics brought in a pulse form with the patient. DNAR and limited interventions are clearly marked. So you proceed to discuss with the patient's son that you're going to try to do everything within your power to stabilize his father, but that you're not planning on any aggressive heroic interventions in keeping with the patient's stated wishes. What are you talking about? His son replies incredulously. I've never seen this piece of paper in my life. This doesn't sound like something my father would want. I don't think he knew what he was signing. The man signs stuff all the time without reading the fine print. My father has a condition called dementia. Do they not teach you about dementia in medical school? See, I read in a blog that it's caused by eating too much tofu. Scientists think hospital. that alcohol may be protective. Are you saying that if Which dad's heart stops, you're just going to stand work? around Sometimes and do nothing? Work. You're medical professionals. This is I literally your do job. not need a piece of paper to tell me that Severus Snape would never betray Albus Dumbledore. The point of these two scenarios is to raise the question of whether it's better to have no goals of care discussions or incomplete goals of care discussions. And the answer is, what? No, it's better to have good goals of care discussions. Advanced healthcare directives and pulse forms are ways to do this, so that's why we're going to be talking about this today. But before having a meaningful discussion, it may be helpful to have some historical context. So let's travel back in time to the 1960s. It was a dystopian age in which smartphones did not exist and dinosaurs ruled the earth. Back then, everyone was presumed to be full code. And this may not be particularly jarring to your 21st century sensibilities compared to some of the other prevailing beliefs and attitudes of the time. If you seek medical attention, presumably you want medical services, and the public presumed that the medical profession was, at its core, led by the principles of altruism and beneficence. In the 1960s, however, the concept of patient autonomy began to gather steam. Through technological advancements, we gained the ability for people with little to no hope of recovery to be kept alive for years and the public began to express sentiments of, this isn't what we want for ourselves. And keep in mind that concepts like hospice didn't even exist at this point, so people lacked the means to express their wishes. Advanced healthcare directives and pulse forms are ways to express these wishes in written formats, so let's talk about them. Advanced healthcare directives. What is an advanced directive? Simply put, it's a written blueprint that outlines your preferences for future medical care namely the general types of medical treatment that you want or find unacceptable. It also allows you to appoint your healthcare power of attorney. More on this later. Who should have an advanced directive? If you're an adult, you can and probably should have an advanced directive. This may come as a surprise to you. After all, you probably aren't anticipating the inability to communicate your wishes anytime soon, so you may not feel compelled to make an advanced directive. Well, no one anticipates that disasters are going to strike. Presumably, you don't expect to get into a car accident anytime soon, but you probably have car insurance. Same thing applies to advanced directives. We always hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. So let's get started by taking a look at an example. Note that this isn't the only form available out there. Some of them may look very different than this, so you actually need to read the text of the document to determine what it says. The first part of this particular document specifies the healthcare power of attorney. If your patient is unable to communicate and make decisions, then this is the person to whom we turn to make decisions on the patient's behalf. Straightforward, right? 
Oh, wait. First of all, there are different types of powers of attorney. Note that the health care power of attorney is different from what's called a financial power of attorney. That person gets to pay bills, buy stocks, manage estates and trusts, sell the house for Bitcoin. We're usually not interested in that kind of thing. Sometimes someone's health care power of attorney isn't the same person as their financial power of attorney, and that's perfectly reasonable. Let me give you an example. Here are two of my friends. To protect their privacy, I'll refer to them as Jimmy and Rachel. Let's say I want suggestions for a hike on Saturday morning. Then I'm going to ask Rachel for advice. Jimmy is my friend, but let's face it guys, he just isn't an outdoorsy kind of guy. On the other hand, if I want to know what video game I should be playing on Friday night, then I choose Pikachu. What can I say folks, Pikachu knows video games. Next, note that there's a space for an alternate agent. If the primary agent is unavailable or incapacitated for some reason, then this person makes decisions. Note that this is different than having multiple primary agents. In some advanced directives, multiple people are appointed to be primary healthcare powers of attorney. This means that multiple people need to come to a consensus. There's nothing inherently wrong about this, I just don't think it's ideal. My best friend and I don't agree on what toppings to put on a pizza, so having two or more people come to a consensus on life or death matters may be asking much. Does a decision maker need to have power of attorney? Well, no. Let's go on a bit of a digression here. If we were to make a list of possible decision makers, it'd look something like this. Let's talk about designated surrogate decision makers. It's simple. The patient appoints a person to make decisions in an emergency. It's quick, it's easy, and you don't need to notarize any special paperwork. It's just, Pikachu, I choose you, and boom, Pikachu is my designated surrogate decision maker. The disadvantage of this is a lack of permanence. A designated surrogate decision maker can change at any time based on the patient's whims, and you should be repeating this question each time the patient goes to the hospital. It may be true that I chose Pikachu during my last hospitalization, but that loser consented me to get a flu shot. I almost died, and now I'm autistic. No way I'm choosing Pikachu again. I choose Magikarp. Yeah, Magikarp clearly has his act together. See, the good thing about a healthcare power of attorney is that this person is listed in a legal document, and this designation remains the same as long as the document remains valid. Take note that not all decision making conforms to Western conventions. Sometimes the village chief shows up, and suddenly he outranks all the patient's relatives. As you can imagine, this can potentially become quite aggravating if you're looking for a single person to sign a whole bunch of paperwork, so be prepared to be flexible. There's also a role called a non-designated surrogate decision maker, but we'll get to that later. The next section spells out some of the obligations of the healthcare power of attorney. Take note of two things. First, if you leave the rest of the document blank, then your healthcare power of attorney can make those choices for you. I can see why people do this. No one can predict the future and all its nuances, and no one wants their family members to be hamstrung by a piece of paper and unforeseen circumstances. That said, I don't recommend doing this. These are weighty, life-changing decisions, and delegating that responsibility to someone puts a lot of stress on this person. Family gatherings are already awkward enough, and the last thing I want to hear at Thanksgiving is my brother saying, Hey, you remember that time you let mom die? So if you express your preferences, in my opinion, that takes a lot of burden of responsibility off the healthcare power of attorney. Next, notice that the healthcare power of attorney is supposed to be carrying out the patient's wishes. We're not asking what the power of attorney wants. We want to know what the patient would want. To give an analogy, let's say that a friend asks me to buy her a cup of coffee, and I buy her green tea instead. She's going to say, hey, that's not what I wanted. And if I say something like, yeah, well, I like green tea more than coffee, so I bought you what I wanted, then I wouldn't have many friends. Likewise, the person you pick for your healthcare power of attorney should be someone who you trust and knows you well enough to make decisions based on what you'd want rather than what they'd want. The next section provides an option that allows the healthcare power of attorney to start making decisions for the patient immediately. Now, I don't really understand why a grown adult would want to do this, but, you know, some people just don't... Wait, hold on one second. Mom, what's for dinner? 
The next section, end of life decisions, is an important one. If the healthcare team is becoming concerned that you're unlikely to recover, should we keep going? Now, pay attention because this is really important. If I check this box here saying that I want to stop or withhold medical treatment that would prolong my life, is that the same thing as saying do not resuscitate? No, it's not. And it's because of the section above it. Imagine the paramedics show up, you're coding, and you have this document in your pocket. They know nothing about you. This is their first time meeting you. They don't know your medical problems. So how can they make a judgment to say whether you have an incurable or irreversible condition? How could they possibly know that it's unlikely that you'll ever recover? How can they be asked to assess whether the risks and burdens of treatment would outweigh the expected benefits? Paramedics can't perform these kinds of assessments, so they're going to start resuscitating you. Choosing not to prolong your life isn't actually a specific order in this case. It's more of a general guideline as to how you'd like your care to unfold over the course of your life. Now let's take a look at the second option. Read this carefully. I want medical attention that would prolong my life as long as possible, within the limits of generally accepted healthcare standards. This is also really important. You see, healthcare isn't like many other professions. Whenever we do things, they need to be legal, moral and ethical, and medically indicated. Let me give you a contrasting example. Let's say you're ordering a pizza, and you ask for a pizza without cheese. Wait. A pizza? Without cheese? Yeah, just bread and marinara sauce. Uh, maybe you want breadsticks and dipping sauce? No! I want a pizza without cheese! If you have the money, your pizza parlor will likely honor your request. It's not their job or their business model to preclude you from making bad decisions. Now let's say you go up to a nephrologist and say, I want to be on dialysis. No, you can't be on dialysis. Your kidneys are fine. No, I want to be on dialysis. I'm tired of urinating. Uh, that's... Um, can I get you a urinal instead? Or a diaper? No, I want dialysis! Even if you're willing to pay out of pocket, there's no nephrologist who'd start you on dialysis on a whim because it's not medically indicated. So getting back to this advanced directive, Note that this states, within the limits of generally accepted health care standards. We're not in the business of providing futile care, and if this box is checked off, it doesn't mean that you're being forced to perform care that's unethical, not medically indicated, or just plain ridiculous. There are still limits to patient autonomy. Moving on to artificial nutrition and hydration. This really deserves its own lecture, but suffice it to say that we don't routinely recommend this for geriatric patients. If I were to get into a horrific car accident, my jaw were stitched shut, but if I were expected to make a full recovery, then yeah, sure, tube feeding may be appropriate. In contrast, if you have a demented patient with dysphagia, I hate to break it to you guys, but the dysphagia is going to get worse over time. For these kinds of patients, tube feeding on average doesn't increase life expectancy or comfort, and it doesn't decrease rates for aspiration pneumonia. And those are probably all the reasons why you'd consider tube feeding in the first place. So if an elderly patient is asking for advice, I don't routinely recommend checking this box. Relief from pain. Most people generally pick this box for obvious reasons, but sometimes a person may not pick this because they're scared of being euthanized. This highlights an important concept called a double effect. Let's say I buy some shave ice. I'm doing so because it's hot outside, and shave ice is yummy. Prolonged exposure to excessive shave ice may lead to diabetes, but that's a risk I accept. Similarly, if I'm giving morphine to a hospice patient, I'm giving it because this patient is in pain or having shortness of breath. I'll be reassessing whether morphine is working, and if the patient's respiration rate drops to 6, or if the patient is too lethargic, I'll back off. If you happen to die a little more quickly, most people would find that to be an acceptable trade-off for not being in agony for the rest of your life. To be clear, in this circumstance, death may be a potential outcome, but it isn't the goal of therapy. This is different than giving a person morphine to euthanize him. If his respiration rate drops to 2, well, 
That doesn't matter if the goal is death. You just keep pushing morphine. So, if someone doesn't want to check this box, I encourage you to examine the patient's concerns and fears. There may be a misunderstanding of what this box means. The next two sections are optional and aren't included in every advanced directive, but they're helpful discussion starters that give cues to the patients and their agents as to where to draw the lines. What makes life worth living? And under what circumstances would you not want your life to be prolonged? This document actually provides some helpful examples. A person may find that participating in family gatherings is really important to him, and he may say that he wouldn't want his life prolonged if he couldn't communicate with his family anymore. So as an example, I love eating spaghetti. If I were ever in a situation in which I could never again enjoy the taste of spaghetti, then stop making me suffer and just enroll me in hospice. Again, this section isn't required, but it's actually very helpful if patients and their agents do have conversations like this. Last section, witnesses. This isn't a formal legal document until this page is completed. Let's skip to option number two for now because it's a little more straightforward. If you take this to a public notary and have the document notarized, boom, your pal. What if you can't find a notary? Well, this document can also be made official if two witnesses sign off on it. Take note, however, there are some stipulations here. Read the fine print. For witness number one, you can't be related to the patient, you can't stand to inherit anything, you can't be a power of attorney, and you can't be a healthcare provider or employed by one. These stipulations are designed as an attempt to keep the process as free from coercion and manipulation as possible. Here's an example. Let's say that Miss Piggy has a will that states that Kermit is set to inherit her estate. There's nothing wrong with that. She also wants Kermit to be her healthcare power of attorney. Also, nothing wrong with that. However, if you think about it, Kermit now has a perverse incentive to ensure that Miss Piggy dies, and he has a means to help affect that. He could sure use the money, you know, to buy pants. As a result, we want to find some objective, impartial witnesses. They should be people who know the patient, but also people who won't try to exert undue influence on the patient, and so there are restrictions on who can be witnesses. Note that witness number two has fewer restrictions. This witness can be a relative of the patient and may stand to inherit something. Note that neither witness can be a healthcare provider. If you're watching this video, then I'm guessing that you are a healthcare provider or are in training to become one, so you shouldn't be acting as a witness. And if you aren't in the healthcare field, then I have no idea how you found this video. But mom, I told you to stay out of my last note. On the bottom of each page, it says, share and discuss this document with your doctor, loved ones, and agent. Some people think that this means to come to a consensus with your family, and this isn't necessarily what this means. Again, in keeping with the Western principle of patient autonomy, we want to respect the patient's wishes, which may be different than the family's wishes. That said, please keep your loved ones in the loop if at all possible. It's much easier for them to hear your wishes from your mouth rather than hearing them for the first time from a piece of paper or from a doctor who literally just met you and your family 10 minutes ago. Goals of care discussions are discussions. If the communication that goes into making the document is garbage, then the document that comes out will just be a piece of paper, and that's what we want to avoid. Likewise, once you've completed a document like this, remember that it's still a discussion. These are written on paper, not on stone, so these wishes may change over time. That's not to say that we want people to upend their wishes whenever a crisis occurs, but let's say that you're in your 30s. The advanced directive that you make now is going to look a lot different than the advanced directive that you make when you're in your 80s. Right now, maybe you want to see your children graduate from college, so you're going to ask for aggressive care to maximize your chances. Maybe right now your husband is an appropriate power of attorney for healthcare decisions, but decades from now maybe he has dementia, and now your daughter is mature enough to make decisions for you. Things change, so be sure to revisit these issues from time to time and make sure that these documents are up to date. Next topic, pulsed forms. What is a pulsed form? Is it different than an advanced directive? Do they cover the same topics? Does one supersede the other? Should you have one or both? Obviously, if these documents were exactly the same, or if one were better than the other, this video would be over. And it's not. So, Jimmy, bring the coffee. It's going to be a long night. 
Well, first of all, pulsed forms are... Wait, hold on one second. Jimmy, I asked for coffee. This is clearly tea. Wait, what? Why would you even... Pulsed forms are provider orders, and orders tend to be more black and white than the directions in advanced directives. If your heart stops, then we do this. Sometimes trainees gravitate to pulsed forms over advanced directives because they feel that they need to be philosophers in order to interpret advanced directives. Speaking of black and white, pulsed forms are usually neon green. They don't need to be green, they're valid in any color. That said, having them in green makes them easier to find when you're searching through a pile of papers, and for a layperson, it helps them if you can just say, did you ever fill out one of those green forms? Let's start with section A. This section comes into effect when a person has no pulse and is not breathing. Boom! You don't need to determine whether a patient has an incurable or irreversible condition. You don't need to weigh the risks and benefits of treatments. If a person has no pulse and isn't breathing, you either do or don't do CPR. That's all. So in contrast to the advanced directive, if the paramedics find this document on your refrigerator with DNAR checked off, they won't do CPR. So what if a person has a pulse and or is breathing? Then section B comes into effect. There's several delineations that occur here. First of all, if the patient gets really sick, does the patient want to go to the hospital? If the answer is no, we should pick comfort measures only. If the patient wants to go to the hospital, then we need to decide between limited interventions and full treatment. Full treatment means ICU care, intubation, pressors, and cardioversion. Limited interventions means less invasive things only, like IV antibiotics. Let's talk about some of the nuances of this section. First of all, you need to educate your patients on what comfort care actually means. Some people see comfort care and think, yeah, I like soft pillows. And that's not what this means. If your patients pick options without understanding them, that's when people get angry. Next, notice that even if a patient does pick comfort care, it may be reasonable to hospitalize the patient in some circumstances. For example, if a patient needs IV morphine and is in a setting in which this can't be provided, hospital transfer could be reasonable for the purpose of providing comfort. Also notice that there's a section for additional orders at the bottom, so nuanced preferences can be written here. For example, a patient who wants full treatment but doesn't want to be ventilated indefinitely could write some additional instructions here. Now let's back up a little and examine the interplay between sections A and B. Notice if you select Attempt Resuscitation, you're required to pick full treatment in section B. Sometimes patients and families don't understand this and will pick CPR with limited interventions. This is invalid. Maybe people get the wrong impression from what they see in movies. The main characters are performing CPR and suddenly the victim starts coughing and gasping for air, and then he's all better. Sorry, this isn't the Heimlich maneuver, and if you've ever participated in a code, you know that this doesn't happen. If you get spontaneous return of circulation, Timmy is getting intubated immediately and going straight to the ICU. So explain to your patients that doing CPR without intensive care is like trying to put out a fire without using water. If you have a patient who absolutely does not want to be intubated or in the ICU, that's a great opportunity to have a discussion regarding the appropriateness of DNAR. One important distinction that you should make is that it's possible to be DNAR and to have full treatment selected. These two things aren't necessarily contradictory. If you still have a pulse and are breathing, then section A doesn't come into play, and you can electively decide to go to the ICU and be intubated. That said, this is an interesting combination of choices, and if someone expresses this to you, this may be an opportunity to explore their reservations against resuscitation a little further. You may be able to convince the patient to choose limited interventions. Section C deals with tube feeding. There's more granularity of control offered on the pulse form compared to the advanced directive in that there's an option to try tube feeding temporarily. That said, you may need to educate your patients on what's a reasonable duration for a defined trial period of tube feeding. Two weeks is okay, but don't put something like six hours. Section D requires a bunch of signatures. Another contrast from the advanced directive is that you, the healthcare provider, will be signing these because they're your orders. Section E provides a place where you can specify a non-designated surrogate decision-maker. Remember when we talked about a hierarchy of decision-makers? 
So the non-designated surrogate decision maker is a person who makes a decision if you don't have a healthcare power of attorney or a designated surrogate decision maker. So how is this person decided? How do you get to be a non-designated surrogate decision maker? Well, the answer actually depends on where you live. In every other state in the country, there's some kind of legal established hierarchy that makes some kind of logical sense. So first they may ask your spouse. If you don't have a spouse, then they ask your kids. If you don't have children, then they ask your parents. Then they ask your siblings, and so on and so forth until they get to your ex-wife's cousin's best friend's college roommate. This is not how things are done in Hawaii. The procedure of the Hawaii law in question is spelled out on the form, you need to make reasonable efforts to locate as many interested persons as practicable. The non-designated surrogate decision maker is then decided from this group of people. Now, you probably have some questions, and that's understandable. How do you define a reasonable effort? If I called the patient's home phone number and no one answered, is that reasonable? Or do I need to hack into this patient's Facebook account? Who is an interested person? What does as many as practicable mean? Is that one person? Two people? A room full of people? A bus full? These are all salient questions, and the law is intentionally vague in order to respect the concept of Hanai family in Hawaii. There's an old saying that goes something like, you can't choose your family. Well, sometimes we do. The truth of the matter is that families and relationships in general are complicated. The people closest to you may not be your blood relatives. Who knows? The point is that unless the patient has explicitly specified a decision maker, this role is potentially up for grabs. You may have some interested persons in your life who you don't trust, and if so, all the more reason to establish a healthcare power of attorney now. The last section of the POST form has some additional instructions and information that I recommend reading. Of note, it lists a limitation on non-designated surrogate decision makers, which is that they cannot independently decide to withhold tube feeding. The moral of the story is that you should really have a healthcare power of attorney. As is the case with advanced directives, this information should be reviewed and updated periodically. Again, that's not to say that we want people to reverse their decisions at the drop of a hat, but these are ongoing, longitudinal discussions, and preferences change as circumstances change. Who should have a pulse form? Unlike the advanced healthcare directive, not necessarily all adults. If you have a patient who has a lot of medical comorbidities and a limited prognosis, that is, if you wouldn't be surprised if you heard that the patient died within the next year, consider a pulse form. Patients who are DNAR and patients who are on hospice should have pulsed forms. Whew, okay, I know that was a lot of information, but I hope that you were paying attention. Because it's time for... A quiz! Hold on. Jimmy, why are these slides so anticlimactic? What do you mean I'm boring? Uh, whatever, you're boring. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, true or false? Advanced directives and pulse forms are the same. The answer is false. If you got this one wrong, oh, I seriously need to rethink my role as an educator. Question number two. A healthcare power of attorney is established by which document? Advanced directive. Question number three. Code status is established by which document? Pulsed form. We've covered a lot of ground today. We've discussed advanced directives, pulse forms, and their differences. The main takeaway I hope you get from this video is that ultimately these are ongoing, nuanced discussions, rather than pieces of paper and rows of checkboxes, even though sometimes they're misrepresented as such. Thank you for your time. Please note that this is only the first step in goals of care discussions. It takes time and practice to become familiar with these conversations and to know the right words to say at the right times, but I have confidence in you. So go out and have some great discussions.